I uh, was professionally working as a waiter at TGI Fridays at the time, um, where I had lots of flair, I might add. And, uh, uh, and I actually, I knew uh, some of the people involved with Mr. Science from um, doing stand-up comedy. And I got this uh, call from Josh Weinstein, who also was on the first season, and he did stand-up as well. And he said, um, you want to come down and do this typing for this weird show that we're working on? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that, because Fridays isn't all that rewarding. So uh, I went down and uh, hit it off with the guys, and I had been with them uh, ever since. He's being modest, because uh, he came into the room, and, and uh, everybody said, feel free to throw in a joke if you've got something in mind. And I'm going to be throwing out these sort of middling, crummy, occasionally nice jokes, and then every time Mike would say something, he would knock the ball out of the park. And oh, he you're just, you know, the room would just collapse in laughter, and we'd have to stop the tape and keep on moving. And then we realized, you know, Mike is one of the six or seven funniest people on the planet, and maybe we should make him a writer. And in no time, he was the head writer. And uh, he's, he's lying, but thank you. The way I came to Mystery Science Theater was kind of odd, and I feel sort of privileged to have been with the thing from its very, very beginnings to its bitter and tragic end. <laughs> um, of course, it's immortal since it's on Rhino Home Video. <laughs> uh, I was working with uh, my pal Jim Mallon at um, KTMA TV 23, the bottom-rated UHF independent station in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And... Um, the, the place was a shambles. It was an underfunded station, but they had a studio and they had cameras, and, uh, and Jim and I knew we had means to do TV comedy, which is what we'd always wanted to do, and we did a few um, of our shows of our own, and we were inviting local stand-up comics to be on, uh, on the station in little showcases, and uh, we invited Joel Hodgson to uh, throw some ideas um, to us, and he came, up, he came up with some sketches of these odd-looking tinker toys uh, sitting in a row of movie theater seats uh, in front of a, a screen with a monster movie or something like that going on. And he had this sort of plan that he would be kind of like the guy from the movie Silent Running, you know, captive with these robots on a ship headed nowhere. And, uh, and the station manager didn't care. He didn't even know what we were doing in there. We, were, you know, we have all these sets out there and we're, we're stealing movies from the film library. And he'd come in and he'd jingle his change in his pocket and say, eh, I don't know what the hell you guys are doing, but you just keep it up there. And, and, uh, and the station, went before, right when we um, sold the show to the network, uh, we found out that the station was going bankrupt. So the timing could not have been better. The station was changed and transformed. It was actually bought by a Christian broadcast group, so the show would not have survived. The designing of the robots was sort of, um, uh, let's say it was haphazard. Um, actually, the, the truth of it is that Joel stayed up the night before the first show. He had not built a single robot. <laughs> and, uh, and he just... His way of doing it was to dumpster dive or go to St. Finney's and get all these old broken toys and what, you know, the George Lucas guys called kit bashing and Joel was doing that for a long time. And a hot glue gun and a couple of screws and uh, he put together crude versions of what were to be the, uh, the three robots. Many, many hundreds of pounds of hot glue over the course of our... Oh, Lord. Gaffer tape, hot glue, staples, yes. string, and drywall screws. Or that's yeah. what the entire thing was held together by. A stiff wind could have knocked any of those sets over. All the interns would get their job running the door, and it was like the, the set was crammed into this little industrial space, and so the interns would have to be back in this little one-foot space, and they couldn't hear anything, they couldn't see anything, it was pitch black. All they knew was this little light would flash, and they'd close the doors. And then after about three hours, we'd say, you can come out now. They'd come out sweating, and like, did we do okay? It was like the worst job we could have ever created. <laughs> And the tunnel, all the doors uh, the, the, down the way, the first one that we did is, uh, the, the thing was truly only about four feet high. So we had a camera on a tiny little handmade dolly with a 12-foot 2 by 4 And we just ran it down this thing and, and, and uh, went through these doors. And again, every intern, everybody in the whole building came in to operate a door, to have one of these torches going, and uh, or put a little radio-controlled beetle running through the the floor there, and um, it was a concerted effort, and it was so cheap. That's the thing, but I love the way it turned out. The way it got onto the network was sort of interesting. At the time uh, we were developing the show, Joel was doing some work for one of the new 24-hour comedy channels. There were two of them, one called The Comedy Channel and one called Ha, and they were in savage competition, but what this meant was they, the, between the two of them, they needed 48 hours of programming a day 
and they had huge gaps in the schedule and otherwise they were showing reruns of like I don't know My Mother the Car or CPO yeah. Sharky and I mean just the lamest sitcoms that you've ever seen in your life um, and Joel had been doing some sort of consulting work with them working with uh, a, an act called the Higgins Boys and Gruber and um, Dave Higgins who was been, she was on he's on um, Malcolm in the Middle Oh, that's right. And, yeah. um, and Steve Higgins, who was a producer for Saturday Night Live for many years. And Gruber, so, who's the Naked Trucker. That's which, right. I don't know, that's a, a long-running show out in L.A. If you haven't seen The Naked Trucker, go see The Naked Trucker. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so we had that in with Joel. And Joel had this pit bull of an agent um, yeah. who was just, he, he was the sweetest guy on the outside. But then when he'd get into a negotiating situation, he was just savage. I mean, he was the, the most menacing guy I'd ever met. Which is perfect for us because we're just loopy Midwesterners. He was a screamer too. Oh man, was he! It would ever. always be sort of embarrassing to be on a three-way call with him. <laughs> this is embarrassing what you're offering. I'm gonna hang up this phone right now. Just screaming at the top of his voice. Yeah. We're just sitting there. Wow, I like this guy. So we had these sort of advocate angels on our side there a little bit. Then people at Comedy Central who already knew who we were, and Rick, uh, who was an amazing uh, agent, and. Um, they needed all of this this programming, and we were perfect for it because we were a two-hour show. Now they tried to get us to move to New York to do it, yes. and we said no. And we said, well, here's what you can do: you can fly to New York on Monday, we can shoot the show, and then you can be back in Minneapolis by Friday. Uh, no, 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 that was no good. Yeah. That was no good. So, but it, you know, having the uh, uh, the main advantage of our show being that we were long. That's what, you know, if nothing else, we're long. It was volume. Yes. So volume just counts, too. volume. I think staying in the Midwest was crucial to the fact that the show yeah, did so. absolutely well. essential. Yeah. There's just no way we could. I mean, that's, the, the point of view is so Midwestern and so, uh, you know, it, it, it had to be. Uh, and also, you know, we would have met the people that we were making fun of. That was always sort of alarming when we go out to Emmy Award ceremonies or something. You see, oh, that's that one we slammed, you know, really bad. So... It was also for our safety, it was best to stay in Minnesota. And a nice bonus is that none of these network executives wanted to come out to the Midwest. They thought it's just this savage tundra where, you know, people have mullets and, and drink beer all the time and beat each other. Which and, uh, is, you know, true. It's pretty much so, the truth. Right? But, uh, so so we we'd, we'd get one visit out of the, the network executives, you know, and then it would just be, yeah, this place is great. Well, 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 you guys seem to be doing a good job, you know, so we'd never have them visit again. It was perfect. When we were on Comedy Central, we had minimal interference with how we wanted to do the show. Um, when we went to the Sci-Fi Channel, because it was USA Network and it was more of a hierarchy, things started to change a little bit, and they wanted us to have a story arc. We said, we can't have a story arc. We're a puppet show. <laughs> we don't need a story arc. All we need is an excuse to tell jokes. And, and the show's... <laughs> The shows ran out of order, so we'd have a story in the show that would just, and then the, another part of the show, um, the story would come, you know, in the wrong place. After three shows, they'd start, or four shows, they'd start rerunning again. So the story was instantly out of sequence, even though they insisted the network was really sort of in trouble at that point. That so you'd sick. watch a show where Kevin is, you know, an ape in one, and then he's in, he's a Roman, you know, <laughs> he's a Roman <laughs> soldier in the next. What? What happened here? To be honest, we did have discussions about what exactly it was going to be. And I don't know if we ever settled on it. No, we <laughs> stop, didn't. Stop looking at me. I'm making up a good story. It's good. Keep no, going. it was, uh, uh, you know, we always just wanted to be funny, be a stream of funny. And, uh, you know, every now and then a, uh, an interviewer would ask, uh, I remember Joel used to like to come up with theories for what the show was. And then you'd read his theories and you'd go, that's what we're doing? I don't <laughs> didn't, He'd come didn't up with them right on the yes, spot, was, and then he'd be a different like one every time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't yeah. know if we ever settled on what the core of the show was. I, I think it was just mucking around with the culture, you know, having as much fun with the culture in this odd little Kukla, Fran, and Ali universe that was invented around this. So and, you know, in a way, it was sort of a tribute to all those old creature feature hosted movie shows with the characters, and every local big market would have one of these things, like um, Sven Gulli in Chicago. Yes. And son and of Sven Gulli. Son of Sven Gulli, yeah. of course, which is what I remember. And there was a nod to that. And it was really simply a way of having the most fun you could with a TV show.